That cannot be. Why would Minister Wang kowtow to the traitor like that? Liu Bei asked, looking up from the letter in his hand. Because he is a traitor himself, I'll wager, Zhang Fei answered. Can we be certain of Lord Tao Chan's purpose here? Guan Yu added. He is asking us to aid him against a minister of the Han. What if his true intention was to test our own loyalty, in order to give Minister Wang an excuse to confiscate the lands under your protection, brother? Lord Tao would never treat with the tyrant. But I thought the same of Minister Wang as well. There should still be no doubt on our part. If they wish to test who our loyalty truly lies with, then let them find out the answer. With this, Liu Bei organized his army for a march east. There, in Langyue Commandery, was this Minister Wang who the message had spoke of. Tao Chen, the elderly governor of Xu province to the south, claimed that Wang was co-opting tax revenues to send to Dong Zhuo's May Pleasure Palace outside Chang'an. Needless to say, a loyal Han official would rather die than see the people's labor support the debauchery of the tyrant. In death, surely the problem would be solved. On the road to Langye, Liu Bei was visited by Mi Zhu, one of Tao Chen's advisors. Can what Lord Tao says about Minister Wang really be true? Liu Bei asked him. It is quite true, and there is more. In the capital, it is said that Minister Wang sent his only daughter into Dong Zhuo's palace, where she resides as the chief among his concubines, Mi Zhu said. The despicable rat, Liu Bei exclaimed. He shows no loyalty to his emperor, and now he makes bribes of his own family. The scoundrel! We can allow his head to remain attached to his body no less than we can allow Emperor Shan to live in peril. We must double our pace. Mi Zhu accompanied Liu Bei to the city of Langye, where walls lined with flags and archers ended their path. The banner of Minister of the Interior Wang Yun was hung from the west gate. Minister Wang, we demand audience in the name of the Imperial House, Guan Yu boomed. Liu Bei and Zhang Fei waited beside him, but no answer came from the gatehouse above. Who will summon Minister Wang for his beating? Zhang Fei shouted, but Liu Bei checked him and called out, I, Liu Bei of Pingyuan, kinsman of the Son of Heaven, am here to pay my respects to His Excellency Minister Wang. Please tell him I have arrived. There seemed to be some deliberation going on between some men in plumed helmets up on the wall, and then finally a response was made. Minister Wang welcomes you and presents you with this gift, a voice shouted. Then the archers drew and released a barrage of arrows. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei swept them away with a flourish of their weapons, then quickly led their elder brother out of range. There is no doubt left, brother, Guan Yu said. We must enter the city and slay the collaborator in full view of heaven. Only then can the people understand your loyalty. Minister Wang was appointed by Emperor Shan himself before the tyrant rose. How could he be so frivolous? Liu Bei said. Don't think about it, Zhang Fei said. He threw away any worth he had just to keep his life, I bet. Let's be rid of him quickly, and then take out his master in Chang'an. The Liu army settled down outside Langye, setting the city to siege. A few days later, they were visited by a large group of peasants from the surrounding countryside. They eagerly, almost desperately, offered up food and clothes for the soldiers, filling Liu Bei with pride. He thanked them heartily, happy that the people had not followed Wang Yun's example, and happy that his men now had plenty of supplies for the onset of winter. The peasants found peace in the belief that those who survived to see spring would be left alone by the invading troops. Next, Liu's camp was visited by another group of peasants, led by a familiar face, a man named Jian Yong, one of Liu Bei's attendants. He had been left to oversee the repopulation of Taishan, but now he and Taishan's new residents were standing out in the stark late autumn fields surrounding Langye. Jian Yong explained that he had abandoned the town when Huang Shao's top general, Pei Yuan Shao, brought an army to demand their surrender. Liu Bei praised Jian Yong for his decisive action, but there was not enough food in the camp to keep them until the business at Langye concluded. Liu Bei thought of sending them with Mi Zhu to beg Tao Chen for refuge, but then, just hours behind Jian Yong, a single wanderer came into camp with an even better solution. 
Liu Bei was called out of his tent by the guards, who claimed that a monk was insisting on seeing him. The monk pulled off his hat, and Guan Yu recognized him at once. It's the traitor Huang, he shouted, readying his blade. Liu Bei waved him back. What do you want, rebel? Liu Bei asked. I come to you on behalf of heaven and the people, Huang Xiao said. I was told that your captain had refused the assistance of Pei Yuan Shao at Taishan and stole away the people there. Here I see that this was no lie. Why do you insist the people suffer at your behest, O oh Lord? Zhen Yong knew what you had in store for them. Your false prayers and rebellious intent are widely known. Why pretend I would think otherwise, rebel? Liu Bei replied. If even you cannot correctly assess my intent, why would a mere follower have better fortune? If you have nothing to say, traitor, then let us be done. I have something to say, something to ask. Let the people go. They are not yours to ferry about as cattle. You've got some nerve, rebel, Zhang Fei jumped in. You enslaved Tai Shan before our very eyes. Enslaved? They ran for their life, and I obliged them. Whereas afterwards, Tai Shan's people were force marched out at the fall of winter by your elder brother here. Who is the slaver? You will not have them back. Now go, Liu Bei insisted. I will bargain for their lives, Huang Xiao said, falling to his knees. Everyone will have their homes and guarantee that I will leave them to be your playthings in all other respects. Just let them have their homes, their farms. As he pleaded, Huang Xiao pricked the palm of his hand with a pin several times, and blood began to leak out. Liu Bei bent down and stopped him, then picked him up. Please stop. Are you promising to end your rebellion? Will you throw down your arms? I cannot do any different to what heaven wills. But I see now that to deal with one such as you means to endanger the people. So I will let you be, for their sakes. After further negotiation, an agreement was made. Huang Xiao left with Jian Yong and the refugees, returning west. Why didn't you kill him, elder brother? Zhang Fei asked. Because then no rebel would ever come to me and beg for peace again, Liu Bei said. Still, he's gonna cause trouble, no doubt. Why trust him? I do not trust him, only his twisted morality. He wants my people for himself. Knowing that, I can sleep safely, knowing he will not harm what he covets. He knows what I will do to his cultists if he does. Zhang Fei didn't buy Liu Bei's reasoning, but ceased his complaints all the same. The snows of winter came, and beneath them the earth resonated with the thudding of picks. Liu Bei's men had tunnelled into Lang Ye and dug out a large pit beneath the city wall, supported by timbers. On their lord's order, they used ropes to pull the timbers from their place. The weight of the stones above crumpled the earth, and the wall subsided down to a mere foot in height. Delighted, Liu Bei ordered the city be stormed at once. His men traipsed through the snow towards the breach, seeing Minister Wang's troops place their banners in the ground beyond it. Arrows flew from the city towards Liu's men, but in the two months waiting for this attack, many had fashioned long shields. The arrows thwacked into the wood like hailstones as the soldiers stamped closer to the wall. Arrows soared in the other direction also, scattering the men who had bravely stood atop the fallen wall. Seeing this, Guan Yu hoisted his weapon and rode out, leaping over the rubble and into the city. There he ran headlong into a squadron of cavalry who he began to kill without question. Behind him, Liu Bei's army crossed into the city also. However, it seems that crafty Minister Wang had kept his troops hidden in the shadow of the wall, as breaches that were once clear now crawled with troops, adorned with Imperial House Liu banners and government armor. Liu Bei gritted his teeth and ordered his men on through. The Han soldiers, Minister Wang's, that is, were too few to resist the weight of the attack, and too outmatched to stop Guan Yu or Zhang Fei carving paths through their lines. Soon the defenders were surrounded, and fled alongside groups of partially armed civilians guarding their homes. Liu Bei's men pursued furiously, killing those out in the streets, and when people barricaded themselves in buildings, fires were started. 
The northwestern district of the city was ablaze by the time the army reorganized for a concerted assault on the administrative compound. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei took the lead, cutting deep into the groups of archers guarding the entrance. Their troops rushed to keep up, and while they suffered greatly with the enemy all around them, the action caused enough chaos that Minister Wang's men began to despair and surrender. As Liu Bei oversaw the disarming of these troops, a man appeared from over the wall of the administrative compound beside him. It was none other than Wang Yun. Wang Yun! The Emperor knows of your deceit and has sent me to punish you, Liu Bei said, grabbing his sword and lashing out. Wait, Lord Liu Bei, you are mistaken, Wang Yun pleaded, staggering back as Liu's blows clanked against his sword. Are you not the traitor Wang Yun, Minister of the Interior, would-be son-in-law of the tyrant Dong Zhuo? I was working to bring the tyrant down, but he suspected something and sent me here. I have only just escaped the custody of his men in this chaos. You must call off your troops at once, the minister begged. Nonsense. I heard you gave your own daughter to the traitor, and you send him money and men on his every whim. What manner of behavior could ever be so ruinous for the Empire? I... wait, Lord Liu Bei. That I gave my darling daughter, Diao Chan, to the tyrant is the price of my scheme. She and I together have pledged to destroy him, but he must not know. If I had opposed the traitor openly, he would have taken my life and had me replaced with one of his lackeys. How could loyal men move against him then? Wang Yun knelt before Liu Bei and pressed his head to the ground, begging for forgiveness and for trust. Liu Bei hesitated in the face of Wang Yun's story. But then he thought again of what Dong Zhuo did to Luo Yang, what his troops had done to its people, and how this cowering minister was feeding that monster. What mattered the excuse for it? What possible scheme of his could justify leaving his young daughter in the den of the mad usurper? Or leaving the emperor in chains for even a moment longer than needed, just to preserve his own life? I would have given my life to stop the traitor and killed my own child rather than let them be taken, Liu Bei thought to himself. Whether Wang Yun was lying or telling the truth, he was wrong, Liu Bei reasoned. He gripped his sword, and Wang Yun's head soon rolled into the gutter. It would not be true to say that this was the last Liu Bei thought of the matter. While Zhang Fei and Guan Yu joined in the revelry of victory, Liu Bei found his knights to be sleepless, haunted by the secret of Wang Yun's words. Every time he reasoned again that nothing Wang Yun could have been planning justified his complicity with the tyrant, but for some reason the question returned to his mind without relent. The next week, Liu Bei travelled south to the city of Donghai. There he prostrated himself on the floor of Governor Tao Chen's court. After all the usual formalities were done and the story of Lang Ye was relayed, Liu Bei and his brothers merrily drank and ate with their patron late into the night. When things quietened down, Liu Bei asked Tao Chen for a tour of the garden and left his brothers with the courtesans in the main hall. Lord, do you know anything of Wang Yun's purpose in serving the tyrant as he did? Liu Bei asked. A purpose? He was close to Dong Zhuo, being the highest of the ministers. Who can tell what relationship they had in the capital, Tao Chen said. You're right. It is only that I can't bring myself to believe that a man whose clan received such generous support from the Imperial House would abandon his obligations, even to protect his own life. Even a long-lived clan such as his must eventually falter. It is like the Han. In these dark times, these great lines rely on heroes to correct their course and cleanse their ills. I am just an old fool, but I see such a hero in you, General Liu. This analysis did not make Liu Bei feel any better for what he did to Wang Yun, but for now he was forced to think on a different matter, as Tao Chen had made his point to service his own cause. Perhaps you will be the one who rescues me from my own downfall, Tao Chan said with a sigh. What possible cause for sighing do you have, master? All loyal men sigh when they think of the state our emperor is kept in. I sigh doubly, for now it seems I will not live to see the son of heaven freed. Tao Cao covets these lands for his own, General Liu. Tao Cao, 
He was a valiant commander during the rebellion, Liu Bei recalled. And did he not already try to kill Dong Zhuo with his own hands, like a true servant of the Han? What quarrel has he with you? Since those days, he has been an outlaw by the traitor Dong's decree. Since he can no longer receive rank from the capital, he saw fit to secure offices by force. You must have heard of how he seized the land around Chen Liu. He was claiming that the Emperor had appointed him Governor of Yan and asked me to stand down. After I refused, he resorted to a more devious scheme. He sent his father for audience with me. I did not understand the ploy and conceded nothing, of course. Then the captain, Zhang Kai, I sent to escort the elder Cao home got drunk and ended up killing the fellow. That's what you get for trusting yellow turban defectors, remember that. Anyway, Cao Cao now claims I planned this from the beginning and calls up men to uphold his fictitious honor. That is terrible. That is the behavior of a tyrant, Liu Bei said. Tao Chen smiled widely. That was my thought as well. Of those who would slay Dong Zhuo, how many would merely replace him? Too many. That is why the only man I can trust in this matter is you, General Liu. Will you render great service to the Empire by stopping the warlord Cao? Liu Bei knelt, saluted, and thanked Tao Chen for the trust in this matter, agreeing without any reservations. Tao Chen was delighted, and the night's feasting was renewed. However, Tao and Liu together had few troops, and Cao Cao was well known as a cunning general in command of heroic battlefield champions, the cream of the men who had risen to answer the Empire's call. Tao Chen understood this well, and knew that only with a man like Liu Bei could he enact his scheme to overcome such raw strength. What was Tao Chen's plan? Read on.